we're more than a year and a half into this pandemic and we're still figuring out just how COVID-19 behaves and how infectious, infectious rather the virus really is. A recent article in Popular Science magazine explores the concept of viral loads and what that actually measures, telling us about how likely a person is to spread COVID-19. Philip Kiefer wrote that piece. He's a staff writer for Popular Science magazine and he's joining us now. Thank you so much for joining us. Viral loads, one of many phrases, I think, Vlad, um, we like did not really know about probably a year and a half ago. It just wasn't part of our regular conversation. Now it is. And we had learned that children, the viral load in children was low, so they couldn't really spread it that, that much and sort of all this sort of stuff. But I don't know if we really understand what it means. So I'm glad you're here. Can you explain what a viral load is? And is that a good way to determine how infectious someone is? Thank you so much for having me. Um, you're right. It is a weird term, but ends up being pretty intuitive. Essentially, it's a measure of how much virus is living in your body. And like you point out, it's important because it tells us something about how much um, you can be expected to spread COVID-19 if you're infected. You know, again, this is pretty intuitive. The more virus you have living in your nose and mouth, um, the more likely you are to be shedding it to other people. But it's not perfect. There's this study out of Tulane University from earlier this year that showed that people with low apparent viral load, they, they seem to have low viral loads, could still be fairly infectious. So um, hmm. your, your piece talks about how the outbreak in Provincetown, Massachusetts this summer changed our understanding of how infectious COVID-19 is. Uh, what did we learn from those cases about viral loads and infectiousness? Because from the, I mean, I know that we are learning these new phrases, as Anne Marie mentioned, but almost from the very beginning, even before we were in the lockdown phase of the pandemic. So going back to January and February, I mean, doctors were telling us to wash your hands um, and to you know, be careful ab about being in closed spaces um, because of how infectious COVID-19 is. So, so what changed? When did we become more aware of, of just how contagious it was? That's exactly the question that I had going into this article, actually. I was talking to friends and family who months out from the Provincetown outbreak were still trying to figure out how infectious they could expect themselves to be if they were to have a breakthrough infection. And so I wanted to know, are we confused about the science from Provincetown? What's happening? Um, and what I found was that Provincetown was important for understanding the infectiousness of the Delta variant in vaccinated people specifically, but it was much more important for confusing people's expectations around the protectiveness of the vaccines and the viral load they could expect to have after being vaccinated. Um, and so I think it starts, like you mentioned, this spring as vaccines were coming out and we were basically being told they are a magic suit of armor. They will stop you from getting any virus whatsoever. If you're vaccinated, you don't need to quarantine. You don't need to wear a mask. Um, Provincetown, as you probably remember, showed otherwise. There were people who um, were vaccinated and got infected. And not only that, but the CDC did this study and found that there's a way you can measure sort of the strength of a PCR result that's a rough analog for viral load. And they found, oh, breakthrough cases and cases in unvaccinated people seem to have a statistically equivalent signal strength. You know, maybe that means that unlike what we had thought previously, we being the CDC, um, vaccinated people can carry enough virus to infect others. Um, that was surprising to me and I think to many of us in the general public, but plenty of epidemiologists and virologists and clinicians who I had spoken to basically said that they had expected something like that all along, that the um, vaccines were really, really, really effective at preventing symptomatic illness and severe disease, but that they expected to see a certain extent of um, 
infectiousness in people who were vaccinated and that Delta made that even more likely because it spread so quickly within a body and between people. Um, and so one of the, so there, there are two takeaways, right? There's the fact that the CDC revised its assessment of what the virus did in the body of a vaccinated person after Provincetown. But it also, I realized looking back, got reported in this strange way. So we, the national media, took this news that the signal strengths were similar between vaccinated and unvaccinated people and asked the question, does that mean that viral loads are similar? Does that mean that vaccinated and unvaccinated people are equally infectious? And that's not what the data showed. Right, you talk in your piece about how the methods to even test someone's viral load aren't perfect. Um, you know, it's so, I think, difficult for people to understand, right? So for, on one hand, they say, the doctors and, and public health officials tell us that if we are vaccinated, our viral loads are lower um, and so that if we were to be infected with COVID-19, even if we are vaccinated, in other words, a breakthrough uh, case of COVID-19, the viral loads would not be as high or as, uh, yeah, as, I guess as high as they would be in an unvaccinated person. Question though for me is, if you do have a breakthrough infection of COVID-19 and you are with an unvaccinated person, how contagious are you to that person? That's I think where it's sort of tricky for lay people. Yeah, but I and think what I, it seems like is kind of sorry. You can sort of clarify what it seems like. What we're lear learning uh, is that the indeed the, the the vaccine provides protection for you, but in terms of your viral load, whatever that actually means, whatever you may be spewing out, it may not be decreased that much. Mm. Is that what I'm understanding? That you know, whether you're vaccinated or not, does not really um, necessarily diminish your viral load. But if you are vaccinated, it certainly protects you from getting very sick. Mm. Both things are true. So you're absolutely okay. right that it prevents you from getting very sick. What it seems like the vaccines do is sort of change the course of the viral load in your body. So going back to the mm. Provincetown study again, it's you know important to remember that those were point in time estimates of how much virus people were carrying in their body. And again, they were sort of approximations. They weren't perfect estimates. And what we've seen since then is that it does look like Delta, when it gets into somebody's body, just reproduces really, really fast. Um, and in vaccinated people, it seems sometimes, some people have still this magic suit of armor, but sometimes um, it continues to reproduce in your nose and mouth. Like you said, it still prevents severe illness because the description I've heard is that it basically a vaccine will create a wall between the tissues of your upper respiratory tract, which are involved in transmitting and becoming infected with the virus, and your lungs and your other organs that when infected end up producing the worst effects of COVID-19. So, you know, we're seeing sort of a, a different progression of viral load in the various parts of your body that can be infected. Um, but since Provincetown, and this is why I say, you know, a point in time, we've also gotten plenty of data to suggest that people who are vaccinated clear virus from their system very quickly, that after three days, um, mm. even if somebody started out with a big dose of virus in their nose, um, if they're vaccinated, they're likely to, um, to mop it up very fast and no longer be infectious. Oh, that's interesting. And yeah. that's important. It's Very. important to, to know, particularly if you are aware of the fact that you were exposed to somebody who, you know, had COVID, um, but you're not feeling any symptoms. So, you know, often I think we find ourselves in those situations where maybe we were in a group, maybe somebody, you know, we find out later had COVID and then we think, uh, are we supposed to stay home? Like, well, what are we supposed to Should I get tested? I have no symptoms. And so it's sort of good to know that even if you were exposed, chances are if you're vaccinated, you know, you're going to clear it out. If you don't, you'll probably start, I, I presume you'll probably start to have some an indication that um, the virus is going to be a little tougher for you to get over. But um, 
It's but, but that is interesting, stuff, Anne-Marie, uh, because, Kiefer. you know, you, mm -hmm. and Phil, I don't know if this is a question for you, or maybe a doctor, but, you know, um, for example, if someone is being tested once a week, right, let's say uh, at uh, their place of business, um, oh, yeah. conceivably what you're saying is that you could be infected on a Monday, and if you take your test on a Friday or a Saturday, you could already be clear from the virus um, if you are vaccinated by the time you are tested. Um, so I, I'm curious if that would even show up on a test. Maybe it does because you still have a little bit of virus inside of you. Maybe maybe it doesn't. That, uh, these are the kinds of, I mean, the questions that we're asking you, Phil, yeah. I, I suspect that these are the same questions that people who go into work every day who must be, who have to be tested are also wondering, you know, if they get exposed to somebody um, uh, who's unvaccinated and, and um, passes the virus on to them and they're vaccinated, could the test miss it? And that's exactly why I'm, um, you know, wary of using testing as a a you know good marker of how infectious yeah. someone is because the PCR tests and to a certain extent antigen tests aren't necessarily looking for live virus they're actually just looking for pieces of the virus that they've been sort of tuned to um, tuned to go after and so it's a hard question to answer because somebody can be, no longer infected, right? Imagine they've had this infection, they've, they're vaccinated, so their body has just shredded all the viral particles, but now their nose is full of little bits of virus. And so they can still test positive on a PCR, um, on a PCR test. And that makes it really, really hard to answer these questions from an individual test result alone. Um, again, you can be vaccinated, not actually ever be infectious or symptomatic. And the fact that your, um, your immune system has done such a good job clearing up viral particles in your body can still lead you to test positive. I don't know how often that happens, but I know that that is a plausible scenario. So I, I always step back and say, you know, there has been this confusion since July when it felt like our heads were all being jerked around by um, this news out of Provincetown. But the CDC guidelines around quarantining have been clarified a lot since then and haven't changed much. So I tell everyone just, you know, Google the CDC quarantine guidelines if you think you've been exposed and then go from there. You know, Philip and Vlad, you guys both bring up like such an interesting point about why you increasingly are seeing municipalities shift to, including New York, a vaccine mandate without the option of testing, because testing may not, it may give us sort of a false, it's a false sense of security that our regular testing will actually be able to somehow keep track of this virus. So that's not necessarily the case, um, based on some of the stuff we're learning from you, Philip. Um, so Philip Kiefer, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.